Hey everyone, happy Thursday to you. Thanks again for joining me. My name is Barton Siever, uh, chef, author, seafood evangelist, but uh, well, uh, the chickens are running around happy in the yard. So hey, I'm feeling pretty good and, and uh, smiley these days, but hey, that's what spring and a sense of renewal will do for us all, right? So anyway, uh, again, my name is Barton Siever and we are going to dive in here. So the first question we've got up is from uh, Deb S., who would love to see me break down a show's proper technique for deboning and breaking down a whole fish of my choice. Uh, and Deb, I saw your question yesterday when you had posted it, and I tried to get a whole fish, but unfortunately I wasn't able to, uh, A, given uh, the circumstances of social distancing, but also uh, we've been having some very high winds here in Maine uh, on the tail of that polar vortex uh, that came through the East Coast, and uh, well, they haven't been out fishing much, and uh, and I don't blame them for that, so there wasn't a whole lot in the market that I had access to, but you know what, in, uh, in future uh, webinars like this, I will certainly do that, and I appreciate you you're writing in on that, so I'm sorry I can't deliver on that today, but there's a good reason for it. All right, next up, Akil, if I eat a rabiata in a restaurant, and come back home to recreate it, I often cannot recreate the flavor, and I'm lost in adjustments you need to do on the flavor. Is it more thyme, more pepper, half a spoon of sugar? Will the course help with that? Well, uh, I, yes, this course certainly will. It'll teach you uh, both my course, the seafood literacy course, as well as uh, the Ruby general courses. Uh, but flavor development, yes, absolutely. It's a huge part of the courses. Uh, but with rabiata sauce in particular, uh, I think the key... And well, to back up a second, arrabbiata sauce is typically served over penne. Uh, this is an, obviously an Italian sauce, and it's a spicy tomato sauce. Um, a relatively very simple uh, tomato sauce, too. Uh, you know, as simple as it gets, it's olive oil, uh, chili flake, tomato paste, and tomato. And uh, there you go. And so it's all about layering uh, flavors and developing those flavors as you go. Uh, and Akil, I think probably the most important thing about rabiata is that it's the chili flake. I and mean, that's what makes it rabiata, not just pasta with red sauce. Uh, chili flake, when added to a sauce, uh, and this is true of, you know, crushed red chili or urfa chili, uh, biber chili, uh, I'm just looking over there, Aleppo chili, you name it. Uh, it's best when the flavor is introduced through fat. Uh, when you just put chili flake in a sauce, what ends up happening, in my opinion, is what I found is that the, the spice kind of ends up on the top, uh, kind of acute uh, and seemingly out of balance or out of sorts with the dish. However, when you start it off in oil, uh, what happens is that flavor mellows and then carries through the dish because it's now part of the olive oil that is infused into absolutely every uh, bit of it. Uh, and this, this is true anytime you use any capsicum, I found, whether it's red bell pepper, whether it's black pepper, whether it's chili flake, uh, fresh hot chilies, you name it. It's that oil that's really going to carry it. And capsicum really is uh, fat soluble. So if you, uh, here's another way to think of it. If you take paprika and just drop a tablespoon into a cup of water, it just kind of hangs out on top and it, it doesn't seem to integrate. However, when you put paprika in with oil, magic, you, you, it integrates and, and that flavor just carries all the way throughout. So step by step, Akil, what I'd say is you start off with olive oil and on a low heat, uh, add your chili flake. And I like to do uh, tomato paste to start a sauce. It just gives it that richness, that depth of flavor and, and that uh, nuance that I think is, is needed. It also helps to thicken it. Um, and because you have that depth of flavor from the tomato paste, you don't have to cook your fresh or your canned tomatoes quite as long uh, to develop that thickness and the, the consistency that you want. So start off with your olive oil, your tomato paste, and your chili flake all at once, and stir it all together just four, five, six minutes over medium, low to medium heat uh, will do it. And you want you want to cook it just until that tomato paste no longer seems raw. The acid is somewhat softened, and you get a little bit more of that sweet 
scent out of it. And then add your uh, your tomatoes, whether you're doing crushed, you know, out of a can, uh, San Marzano's, whatever, bring it to a boil, just simmer it down and mix it together. I think that's how you most effectively balance what is such a simple sauce. If you want to continue to sort of evolve the flavor, yeah, a, a pinch of sugar in tomato sauce often just does wonders uh, in bringing everything into balance because tomatoes really are a very acidic ingredient. Uh, and you mentioned thyme. Um, yeah, thyme is, thyme is a great flavor to introduce into that. And I would add it at the same time as the tomato paste and the chili flake to sort of carry that flavor throughout. Leave it in just before you serve and then pull out the stems. So, hey, Akil, thank you so much for your question. I appreciate it. All right, uh, another one from McGill. At the end of the course, you want to be in a position to whip up pleasant tasting food with what you have on hand rather than buying your ingredients. Is that a reasonable expectation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in all of our courses, we teach you about the ingredients. Um, and I say all of our courses, I mean, mine as the, the seafood literacy instructor, but I know also from taking some of the other Ruby courses, uh, that it's really about the ingredients, about the technique. So it's not so much a recipe driven education so much as it is, hey, we're gonna teach you how to throw together dishes regardless of what you have. And once you understand those basic techniques, like as I was just talking about with the layering and building flavors with a very simple ingredient, tomato sauce, yes, absolutely. That's the foundation of good cooking. It's not, it's not good ingredients. That's just good ingredients. That's that's the foundation of good shopping. The foundation of good cooking is knowing how to build upon those good ingredients. So, yeah, Akil, thank you so much. All right, Natasha, what has been the best thing about being a chef? Cool, nice question. Uh, the best thing about being a chef is uh, the camaraderie. Uh, not only amongst, in a professional sense, amongst the uh, men and women that I had the great fortune to work with, but, um, you know, and, and the, the creative camaraderie that's there as well, because everybody's got a very subjective viewpoint on food and coming together as a team to share that and to coalesce uh, you know, from ideation to purchasing to execution to plating. It's, it's such a wonderful collaborative process. Uh, that was one of the things I liked a lot. But what I like the best is, as I said, when I started off, food is love. Uh, feeding someone is an act of kindness, and so often people reciprocate to the cook with kindness, with acknowledgement, with appreciation, uh, and just an acknowledgement that, well, you are a significant part of their day, and wow, I, what a cool thing, what a cool thing to do, and, and you know, the life of a professional chef uh, it sucks. It's hard. It's a tough life. Uh, but it's also really amazing. And uh, the honor of being able to, to feed people, for them to put their trust in you, to spend their hard-earned dollars uh, coming to your table to be entertained. Wow. What, what a recognition. What an honor. Um, I never took that lightly, and I'll never lose that that joy that I felt for being able to do that. So, um, those are sort of the the large uh, romantic things that I liked the most about being a chef, but also on a more practical level, uh, just the quality of ingredients that we that was available to me. Um, you know, in in my restaurants, we Hook, uh, which was my signature restaurant, my flagship. Uh, you know, we did millions and millions and almost $10 million a year in business. Uh, and we were a seafood restaurant. So I, I spent a, I, I wrote a lot of big checks to fishermen, <laughs> a lot of big checks. Those are our primary ingredient. So fishermen gave me some really good stuff. Uh, and some really good relationships with them. And, uh, just the, st the, the things that came into my kitchen were of such wonder and amazement that, uh, you know, it's it's near impossible to get that in any circumstance, but the professional kitchen. Um, and even though I live here on the, now, I live here on the coast of Maine. If I want that, I can just go get it. And my neighbor's a fisherman here. That neighbor's a lobsterman. So uh, we trade chicken eggs for it. So I still have access to that. But yeah, 
So, hey, Natasha, thanks so much for your question. Appreciate that. All right, Susan, how do you get a perfect sear on both sides of salmon filet while keeping the center moist yet cooked through? Good question. And I'm going to ask a question back to you to start this off, which is to say, what's the purpose of your searing? What are you trying to achieve? Is it texture? Is it flavor? Is it both? Is it color? Is it presentation? Uh, because what I'm going to sort of respond to you with is to say, well, if you're trying to achieve texture, you don't need to sear more than one side. Uh, and that would be the skin side if you were using it with the skin on. Uh, or the flesh side, not the skin side, if you're not using the skin. You always want to sear the presentation side first. Um, if you're looking for flavor, you really don't need to sear more than one side. Uh, if you're looking for that textural contrast and, and just the, the coloration, again, I don't think you need to sear more than one side because you can accomplish all of those goals with one. Now, there's nothing wrong with searing two sides. However, what you do is you increase the likelihood that you're going to overcook through the center. So if you are good with the texture or the flavor or the color or the presentation aspect of just searing one side, that's what I would recommend. Uh, remove the variable because searing is inherently a high heat application. Cooking seafood properly to maintain moisture yet cook throughout to that perfect flaky texture is best done at lower temperatures. So that's why I suggest a hybrid method. So I've got these uh, lovely cast steel and cast iron pans, things with some weight to them and some thickness. And what I'll do is I'll set this toaster oven up right over here at 275 degrees uh, on a roast setting. And then I'll get that pan rip roaring hot on the stove. And I'll put a piece of fish down, uh, skin side down. And just as it begins to color, I'll take the whole pan without flipping the fish and throw it right into the oven at 275 so that you have the heat of the pan directly cooking and searing the skin side and you have the ambient heat of the oven slowly cooking the filet through. And the other advantage of searing one side, especially if you're using the skin, is that you're, you're using that skin as a barrier to help protect the flesh from that high heat from drying out. So uh, that's Sort of a, a, a bit of a long way to, to answer your question, but I think there's a lot of questions, as I mentioned, to be asked uh, in terms of just the purpose of this. Um, the other thing about searing is that uh, searing is the caramelization or the browning, the coloration, crisping of one side. None of those uh, actions happen in the presence of moisture. Moisture, water, just it has to steam off or boil off before you can really begin to get the caramelization, which happens at temperatures above 212. So you got to cook off all that water just to get to the stage where you can begin to sear. The answer there? Well, dry off your piece of fish really well. Uh, pat it dry. There are these wonderful pieces of paper that uh, are wraps that Japanese sushi cook and sushi cooks use that helps to wick moisture away from the filet. Uh, you know, or simply just put it between some paper towels and just pat it dry and get it really dry on that surface so that you avoid that steaming process. Uh, I've even seen you know, Chef Thomas Keller, uh, the amazing Thomas Keller, I've seen him scrape the filet uh, on the skin side with a knife in the opposite way that the scales would run just to get all of that moisture off to literally scrape it off like a windshield wiper. Uh, in order to quickly get to that sear uh, action. So thank you. Appreciate your question, Susan. Alexander, hey, Chef. You're a wonderful teacher. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. It's kind words. Uh, enjoy your videos. I would like to ask you a question. Uh, on your way to becoming a chef, what was the most difficult stage for you and why? Thanks. Uh, good question. Um, the most difficult stage? Hmm. <laughs> Well, there were, there were a couple of uh, difficult stages. Um, I think 
maybe chief amongst them, but I wouldn't say difficult in the way that I was pulling out my hair and just like lamenting anything, uh, but trying to find my own voice, my own pathway. Uh, you know, there's a saying that nothing is, nothing in food is new. Human beings have been eating f- for the entire history of humankind. Uh, you know, there, there's very little that we can do that's truly innovative. Um, and so trying to innovate your way to your own path uh, is just very unlikely. Uh, so finding your voice, finding which pairing of cuisines or which direction within a cuisine uh, to really dedicate yourself to. That was fairly, I wouldn't say difficult for me because I always had a, a real passion for seafood. But as a chef, it's very hard to edit yourself. The sort of the initial, the exuberance of cooking is like, ah, I'm going to throw a bit of shallot in there. I'm going to throw some garlic in there and some olive oil and pistachio oil and ooh, tarragon and, and some rosemary. Oh my God, this is going to be great, right? Ooh. Well, bottom line is no. No, actually, it was great. And now you keep complicating it till and now it's a little bit muddy. Um, great cooking is the act of editing. It's, it's not what to add. It's what to take out. Um, so finding that pathway, that clarity in my career of how do I want to represent myself, my ideas about food, and how do I want to best present and represent the ingredients I choose to work with. That was quite a process. Uh, I mean, it, it's been literally a coming of age process for a chef. So uh, you know, focus on that, I think is a great way, because when you have that clarity of, of knowing that with an ingredient, I want to express it in this way, whether it's a California cuisine where it's focused on fresh and vibrant pairings rather than really technique and methodology and reductionism the way that French cuisine is, which is layering of flavors. Um, California cuisine is just kind of pairing of flavors. Okay, once you decide that that's your avenue, wow, things get a lot easier and you can really focus on the food, on the dish. Um, So there's my answer. Uh, The other hardest parts about becoming a chef are uh, dealing with being on call on the holidays and missing family. And, um, you know, I dated my now wife uh, between the hours of 11.30 p.m. and 3 a.m. Uh, because that was the only time I had to see her. Uh, yeah, just schedules make it difficult. But, um, yeah, it really is a rewarding profession and, and one I, I, I highly suggest and support people going into. So, hey, thank you very much for your question, Alexander, and for your kind words. All right. Uh, Ali. Uh, hey, chef. Come from a region where they use a lot of herbs and spices for fish seasoning. What's your favorite fish seasoning? Well, uh, I come from a region where they use a single spice for fish seasoning, and that I, I was born and raised in the Chesapeake Bay region uh, in Washington, D.C., here in America. Uh, and Old Bay the, is the, the iconic flavoring for seafood there, whether it's a crab boil, a shrimp boil, a piece of bluefish, some mackerel, whatever it is, whether it's your Cheerios in the morning, I swear, we put Old Bay on everything. Um, so Old Bay is kind of the flavor of my youth, if I, w- if, if I may. But um, a couple of ingredient pairings that I've come to just really appreciate. Mace. Mace is what I call the seafood spice. Now, mace is uh, familiar to us. Uh, to many of us, because it's, well, it's very similar to nutmeg, because, well, it it is nutmeg. It's the lacy outer hull of the nutmeg. The nutmeg itself is a, well, it looks like a nut, and is the inner fruit. And the lacy hull is the mace. And mace has a slightly more savory component and character to it than the baking spice uh, that nutmeg kind of represents. Uh, It definitely adds its own flavor, but it accentuates seafood in such a beautiful way. It draws out that that violet scent, the cucumber, sometimes the watermelon scent that that some seafoods exhibit. Uh, It is so elegant and graceful. 
uh, in its presence in a dish. It definitely adds weight. You know, it's not a light, airy flavor, but it is an elegant, nuanced flavor that just a little bit of it goes a long way. Uh, other spices that I really like, I think smoked sweet paprika is magic. I think it's a, a magical ingredient when used in very small quantities, and especially with shellfish. There's something about that sweet glycogen, uh, fatty richness of shellfish that just matches perfectly with the smoked sweet paprika. Uh, also known as pimenton in, in Spanish cuisine, where I learned how to use it. Uh, and then getting into herbs, uh, all things fennel. So fennel seed, uh, fennel pollen, fennel itself, fennel stalks, uh, pernel. If you see behind me, I've got pernel bottle, I've got an herb sant bottle. Those are both anise flavored liqueurs uh, that I use to finish a lot of dishes. Fennel and all forms of seafood just go beautifully together. Whether you're grilling a piece of seafood over fennel stalks, where you put the fennel stalks on the grill grates and the fish on top of it, so they singe and sear and slightly smoke and perfume the entire filet with, with that luscious sort of uh, Provencal French just beauty. Uh, fennel seeds are just brilliant as well. Uh, but then in terms of herbs, uh, tarragon is... Uh, about number one in my book in terms of what it does for seafood. Again, it has somewhat of a, an anise-like flavor. And so it just adds this wonderful richness. And uh, I think it, like tarragon and salmon are like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire to me. They just, it's just perfect. Um, but then really the soft herbs, chervil, parsley, uh, separately, uh, cilantro, but then also Mint. Mint, when used with parsley in particular, uh, just gives things this wonderful vibrancy that really highlights the freshness of seafood in really great ways. So I know that that's a lot, but uh, I also didn't mention a whole lot of spices and a whole lot of herbs. Uh, so I hope that helped you narrow it down a bit. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Sunny. Is the majority of seafood in the case of the grocery store previously frozen? If so, is it okay to buy in bulk and freeze once home? Great question. Uh, you know, I've never, so let me start off with saying frozen seafood can be and often is a great thing, a great thing. So frozen seafood has earned a bad reputation in years past because admittedly for, well, until very recently, it was not very good. It's what we did on... Friday night after the fish hadn't sold to the faithful uh, at the market. And it was a way to kind of stop it from going bad. It was the last step before throwing it out. Um, and so we were using inferior technology, meaning our freezers at home, which are not meant to freeze things. They're meant to keep things frozen. Um, and those are different actions that should happen at different temperatures. So we were basically trying to stop spoilage rather than to arrest pristine quality, which is now what frozen seafood is capable of doing. Uh, there's fresh frozen or frozen fresh is terminology for it. The seafood is being frozen at negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit uh, within hours after coming out of the water. This is not stopping spoilage. This is arresting pristine quality. So first and foremost, I recommend frozen seafood. But in terms of what's in the case, is most of it previously frozen? Well, they should be telling you if it was. Um, but then you should also be telling them, no, thank you. The benefits of frozen seafood is that the clock has stopped. It's not perishable. It's not going anywhere. That quality is locked in. It's a convenience food. It's there in the freezer for you at your ready. But once they thaw it out to put it in the case, tick, tock, tick. Talk, they've started the clock for you. Why? I mean, hey, I, I mean, I get it that people want a, a fresh piece of fish to maybe take home tonight, and, and that's great. I, I'm not faulting for it. But if they've got previously frozen fish in the case, that means they have still frozen fish in the back. Ask them for that because guaranteed that product was frozen first time at, with much greater technology than your Kenmore or Gen Air might be able to do. So don't shy away from frozen fish. Buy it frozen. Keep it frozen uh, is what I would recommend. Thanks. Appreciate you, Sonny.
All right, Kevin. When preparing meals that call for browning meats and sautéing vegetables, do I brown the meat first, remove the meat from the pan, then sauté the vegetable, or sauté the vegetables first? Thanks. Uh, that's a good question, Kevin. And I'm assuming you might be thinking about a braised dish where, where things are cooked together, like beef stew, for instance. Um, I'm going to say cook the meat first, because with the vegetables, uh, very often you're not trying to sear them, to really darkly color and change the flavor of them, uh, so much as you're just trying to you know, wilt them, to, to get them prepped, to be simmered together for those flavors to meld. So when you add anything to a pan other than fat, you're adding moisture. Moisture is the antithesis of searing, as we were talking about a uh, question earlier. Uh, so sear the meat first and then remove, because then you're, you're going to get the best quality sear on the meat. Plus, once the vegetables go in, well, then they can help you break up what's known as the fond or all those little bits and pieces that are left in the pan or you know, stuck to the pan after caramelizing, searing the meat. Those vegetables are going to very quickly uh, release moisture and help you to scrape that off to get all that good flavor into the dish. <clears throat> So, yeah, I'd recommend meat first, remove the meat, then vegetables, and then put them all back together in the pan. Uh, and even if you're not doing a braised dish, say you're just doing a seared steak uh, and some sautéed zucchini, sear your steak first, both sides, and then put it in your toaster oven to cook all the way through. And now you've got this pan with all that great flavor bits left in it. Saute your zucchini right in that. Hey, it's one pot, one less to wash, right? And uh, you get all that flavor co combined into both aspects of your meal. Cheers. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate your question. All right, Jan. Barton, if you were to prepare salmon filet for three or four people to reheat and serve later as in takeout delivering from a restaurant, how would you prepare? Good question. Uh, so one, one thing to say there is why reheat it afterwards? Uh, there are many ways to make really charismatic, beautiful dishes where the salmon is served at room temperature or even cold. So rethink maybe or just consider that formulation of your dish. And uh, something there would be like a poached side of salmon or poached pieces of salmon that were then cooled in that poaching liquid. Uh, so they really absorb all of that flavor and cook perfectly through. Uh, that poaching liquid can then be reduced and made into a vinaigrette or a marinade for the salmon. Uh, all sorts of ways that you can uh, do to create a really compelling dish there. Uh, but in terms of a dish to reheat once, pre, uh, once cooked, when cooking anything, lowest heat possible, I think, on the first round of cooking is best. Um, you know, I'll cook salmon in toaster oven or regular oven, 275 degrees, simple salt on it, nothing else. Uh, and that will cook it so delicately and cook it all the way through so you retain all of that moisture. The cellular structure doesn't coagulate to the point where it pushes moisture out or, or uh, exudes fat and protein out of the filet. So by the time you go to reheat, you've just got more to work with, right? I mean, that makes sense. If you're trying to retain moisture by the end of the second cooking, well, start with more moisture at the end of the first cooking. Um, and then also suggest in the reheating process that lower heat is used. Um, you know, for example, if you have a pre-cooked piece of salmon and you put it in the, in the toaster oven at 275 degrees to reheat after already cooking it, and then say finish it under the broiler for the last four minutes of the 15 minutes of reheat time. And that is more than ample time to warm it all the way through and to give it just a little bit of that burst of heat. So when it hits the mouth, it's hot and it really excites the palate. So there you go. Hey, thanks, Jan. I appreciate your question. All right, Tony, is it acceptable to skip a recipe task on the professional cook course and return to it a few days later? Missing a few ingredients, not able to shop as often during lockdown. <laughs> yep, uh, but don't wanna waste time and not move on with the course. 
Uh, Tony, yes. Uh, the courses, from what I understand, all the Ruby courses, but certainly my own with Seafood Literacy, are designed that you can drop in and out of them wherever you want. Uh, certainly there's a continuity of learning that you want to maintain to the best possible, but certainly not. If, if you miss one recipe, you're not going to screw up your entire education. Uh, and yeah, dedication to continue is probably more important than that one recipe. Um, but uh, yeah, so there you go. All right, Tony, another question. I know that prawns should be deveined before cooking. Uh, there seems to be two veins running the length of the prawn, one on the top and one on the bottom, which needs to be removed. Okay, so uh, the vein on the bottom, I'm not uh, really familiar with that. Uh, it, I, and I wouldn't call it a vein, if anything. What you might be seeing is any sort of egg uh, mass when shrimp are... Uh, egg bearing. They carry their eggs within their little swimmerettes, those little feet that are underneath the shrimp. So on the concave side of the curve. So if this is your shrimp head and this is your shrimp tail, uh, this is the bottom of it where the little swimmerettes are. And if you're talking about a vein that's along that side, um, either it's, it's part of an egg mass or uh, it might just be part of the shell or coloration, but there's really no need to remove anything on that side. It's really just on the top side that you'll see uh, what needs to be removed. And that is that is the digestive tract uh, that runs through the tail and should be removed. So next time. All right, Lorette. Ooh, what a beautiful name, Lorette. I like that. Please highlight a quick recipe for a can of sardines. Oh, you want a quick recipe for a can of sardines? Okay, open it, use a fork. Put it in your face. I love it. I mean, that's that's the beauty of sardines is that they're so delicious right out of the can. Um, but uh, not to be uh, coy about it there. But uh, summer's coming. We're going to have fresh, ripe, beautiful heirloom tomatoes, peppery, punctuating arugula, uh, thick, big slices of heirloom tomatoes laid out on a plate covering the whole bottom, drizzle with a little bit of olive oil and salt. And a pile of arugula on top, and then just open your can of sardines, pour that oil over top, a little drizzle of vinegar or lemon juice, and then just flake the sardines on top, and you've got this wonderful composed salad. Um, uh, as a little appetizer, a quick dish, uh, take just a piece of bread, toasted or untoasted, with a slather of room temperature butter, and put just a piece of sardine on that and a couple drops of lemon juice, it's an amazing way uh, to eat it. It makes a really elegant appetizer. Um, and you can even chiffonade or shave some very fresh herbs over top. Mint and parsley would be delicious. Um, so a number of ways to use them. Uh, but my son, my three-and-a-half-year-old kid squid, he, uh, he loves him some sardines. He calls them baby sharks. Baby sharks, do 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 do, do baby sharks. Yeah, I did that to you. It's two two weeks in a row, I've got to sing that song in my little webinar here. Great. Um, he just eats them straight out of a can with a little bit of lemon juice drizzled into them just to punctuate the flavor. And uh, yeah, I love it. So. Hey, Lorette, thank you so much for your question. I appreciate you. All right, Nicholas, I'd like to have more idea for preparing ceviche. When is the best fresh fish can be used and how long to be marinated before serving? Great question. Uh, I can't tell you the best fish to use because uh, ceviche is entirely dependent upon the quality of, of the raw product. So if I were to say, hey, red snapper, it's the best for ceviche, and then you go to the store and the only snapper that's available is not very good quality, you're going to come back to me and say, what the heck were you talking about? So ceviche fish, let's talk about what are the characteristics that make a fish good for ceviche. Uh, a tight flick, a taut texture, uh, some fat is a good thing uh, so that it retains uh, sort of a duality of texture. So something like a salmon is great for ceviche, uh, but also leaner fish like flounder. Are. Um, you want a fish that's not going to fall apart when raw. So uh, a lot of flounders like sole or dab, place uh, have a very delicate texture when raw. So once you go through the whole mixing process, the marinating process, the spooning out onto the plate process, then the eating process, it's 
probably not going to be intact. So something that's going to hold texture is the, the first place to start. Uh, I'd also say something it's important uh, with ceviche to figure out if you want the dark tissue or not. The dark tissue is the bloodline um, on, in seafood. That's where the oxygen and, and uh, nutrients are carried through the blood into the flesh. That has a different flavor, stronger flavor than the filet does. So it's as important to figure out if you want that flavor in your dish or not. Um, and that's just a technique as to how to skin it or how deep to cut it. Um, and how long to marinate also depends on the density of the fish. If you're using a red snapper, um, I'd say anywhere from half an hour to two hours. I like my fish marinated longer. Uh, I like it to be fully cured, or cooked, or coagulated, sort of tensed in that acidic, you know, leche de tigre or whatever mixture you're using. Um, so denser fish, if you're using something like uh, swordfish, which I don't really recommend for ceviche, just out of my own personal taste, that's going to take longer because of the density of the fish to marinate all the way through. So that could be up to several hours. Whereas a very delicate piece of fluke, which is a type of flounder, uh, can be ready in as little as half an hour. So, uh, sorry, I don't have a clear and concise answer on that, but again, focus on quality, focus on texture, and uh, also, of course, focus on safety. Any raw seafood that you're eating, uh, with few exceptions, really look for fish that has been properly frozen ahead of time. And if you have the luxury of buying your fish from a, a you know, knowledgeable fishmonger, tell them what you intend to do with it. Ask them their recommendation uh, and just make sure that you're buying a safe product. Okay, thanks. Appreciate your question, Nicholas. Uh, tilapia fish for ceviche. Ask them on. Yeah, tilapia is a good one. You know, I, hey, it's it might be a little surprising to you that, you know, Chef like me is, is recommending tilapia, but hey, well, I'll be honest, there's a lot of bad tasting, not so great tilapia out there, which is still a fine product, but uh, there's also a lot of really great quality tilapia out there. Uh, there's a couple of producers from Rainforest Tilapia down in Costa Rica to uh, Regal Springs Tilapia, which operates out of Mexico and Thailand. Um, uh, both of those are really compelling culinary ingredients and are available at Walmart. So. Nothing fancy there, just good quality. So, hey, thanks, Esteban. I appreciate your, uh, your comment there. All right, Tony, you want to check the internal temperature of filet steak or chicken breast. How do I do this properly with a food thermometer? Insert the probe so the juices won't escape. Uh, well, yes, that's true. If you do insert the probe, the juices will escape because you've penetrated or punctured that seal on the outside and just exposed more surface area to that exudation. Uh, that is a worthwhile uh, sacrifice to me. Um, you know, if you're not able to, given the cut or the size of the type of dish that you're working with, or not uh, you know, experienced enough to really just know on intuition and be experienced what the temperature of a steak is by, by touching your chicken breast, uh, you know, it, it's worth getting it right. So sacrifice a little bit of the juice to do the thermometer. Um, some thermometers, though, are better than others. So a lot of thermometers, if this is your, your temperature gauge on this end, and this is your probe end, some thermometers have the heat sensor unit, which is mark demarcated by a little dimple. They'll have it right somewhere in the middle or a third of the way down. Other thermometers have the temperature sensitivity at the tip. And that's the ones you want to use for delicate or smaller portions because you only have to go in so far to get an accurate reading. Um, you know, if, if the temperature gauge is all the way here and you got to push it all the way in uh, that much past where you would want to go just to get an accurate reading. So uh, good equipment, uh, We'll solve some of the problem on this, but again, it's worth the sacrifice to get the dish right. Cool. Thanks again, Tony. All right, Sharon, 
The salmon fillets I get here are skinless, so I can't put them under the broiler skin side up. How do I protect the top fillet from drying out? Well, uh, crusts, you know, uh, coatings uh, are a good way to do that. Uh, and fat is another good way to do that. So panko mixed with panko breadcrumbs mixed with uh, some melted butter with some chopped herbs in it. Beautiful way. You put that right on top and you throw it in a broiler, low broiler, so it has the time to cook while the, before the, the breadcrumbs burn. All you're doing is creating a flavorful barrier there. And so long as the flavors are amenable or friendly to the dish that you are serving, great, that's a great way to do it. Um, uh, you know, from crusts, you can also do nuts on top. Uh, and there's a whole host of different ways you could do it, including um, you know, covering the fish entirely with uh, tinfoil or parchment paper, you know, building a little dome over it so that it cooks slow and slow, or even just cooking it on bake function at 275 until it's 90% of the way cooked. Pull it out, turn your broiler to high, put the rack all the way up as close to the broiler as can be, and then slide the fish right back under it. So you're going to finish cooking it under the broiler, not cook it all the way through. So you get that char, that crisp, that sear, but you're not relying on that super high heat to cook the entire foil. So that hybrid heat method or crust method is what I'd suggest. Cheers. Hey, thanks, Sharon. Appreciate you. I appreciate your question. Stacy, is there a brand of cookware, pots and pans that you can recommend? Um, it depends on your budget, really. Uh, there are uh, there's cookware in every uh, budget category. That's really great quality stuff. Um, also, it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, you know, highly specialized uh, pans. I, I don't think are really necessary. You know, in my kitchen, I, I'm very blessed and fortunate. I have a, I have a very wide range of uh, materials to work with. Uh, I have copper pots. It was a lifelong dream of mine, and I, I worked really hard and saved up my allowance for many, many years to afford a really nice set of Moviel, uh, a French copper pot. Uh, that is, it's the Lamborghini of pots, uh, but it also cost <laughs> not quite what a Lamborghini costs, but well, it's up there. Um, there's just a lot of, of great cookware, and what I would say is. Uh, instead of buying a specialized grill pan and a cast iron pan uh, and splitting your budget, you know, I'm not sure you really need the grill pan. So get the best cast iron pan you can. Lodge makes incredible quality cookware. Staub and Le Creuset are both go-tos in my kitchen that I'm so very fortunate to have. Uh, those are very expensive as well. That said, I am going to be passing down my cookware to my sons. So they're going to get some life out of them. Um, but in terms of actual brand names, uh, I, I have to admit I'm not too familiar with a, a lot of what's on the market now, uh, especially because a lot of the new stuff that I see people getting pretty excited about is uh, being available through Kickstarter. Uh, I see a lot of ads on my Instagram feed for pans from like Misen and, and others, uh, which, hey, the ads do a really good job of making them look good. Um, so those direct marketed to consumer do also come with a better price tag because you, you're cutting out the middleman, uh, but you're also cutting out the, cura the curation of say a Williams-Sonoma. Then anything you're gonna buy from Williams-Sonoma is good because they're, they're putting their name behind it. So. Uh, again, I'm sorry I don't have a clear, concise answer, uh, not knowing your budget, but um, yeah, figure out which pans you use the most and then invest in those uh, and don't think you need a whole set. Thanks. Hope that helps, Stacey. Appreciate you. All right, Laurette again. Can you talk about your class, which offers experiential cooking from boat to table style? Forget the name. Tell me more. Please like it and uh, offer this here. So... Uh, my online course is called uh, Seafood Literacy, uh, and it is a comprehensive course that runs through everything about seafood from what is seafood, what's its muscular structure, why it's different than 
land animals like you and me and pigs and chickens, how it's caught, uh, how to think about it categorically. So in the end, the course teaches you how to look at any piece of fish and know what to do with it rather than trying to teach you how to know what to do with each and every single species because they really all fit into a culinary category, whether it's flaky white flesh fish, orange flesh fish, filet fish like red snapper or striped bass. Um, and then we go through uh, the common culinary techniques, but uh, not so much to teach you how to saute, though you'll certainly learn that if, even if you were a novice, but really it's about using the saute technique to teach you the nuances and the beauty of seafood and how it is a unique protein and a unique cooking style. Um, so it's offered year round, available anytime. I know we have a, cl a, a class though, starting up in June, on June 16th, I believe. But, um, and that's just sort of when a cohort is all joining at the same time, but you're welcome to sign up at any time. So, hey, Laura, thanks again, appreciate it. All right, Chris, what's the hardest type of fish you find to work with and what is the easiest? Well, the hardest are, uh, to be honest, the ones with less fat. So the really lean proteins, so uh, tilapia, flounder, cod, uh, because those are the least forgiving in terms of, well, if, if you overcook a piece of salmon, it's still pretty darn good because it's got so much richness in it to kind of balance that out. So just from a practical standpoint, um, I think those are the more resilient fish, the fattier they are. Uh, salmon, bluefish, Chilean sea bass, um, sable fish, also known as black cod. Uh, these are fish that it, it's kind of harder to mess them up than it is to, um, to get it right. Um, and that said, just to caveat, cod and tilapia are very easy to cook as well. But um, yeah, so the fattier the fish, the more resilient. But also, quite honestly, the more omega-3s it's going to have in it, the better it is for you. So but all fish is good fish. Okay. Um, hi, uh, Jean. My dream is to be a chef and work in a restaurant. What training do you recommend? I can't afford university fees, but, uh, but can't afford a cooking school, eight-week course to compete. Uh, Ruby course, is this a good start? How can I learn my dream? Well, uh, absolutely. The Ruby courses across the board are you know, best in class. Uh, and really do offer a comprehensive methodology of learning how to think about food, which, you know what, if you were to come into my kitchen when I was running restaurants and present to me that you, you have done this, you have done this and this, and it was just a resume uh, that sort of you checked boxes, that is impressive, but it's less impressive than coming in and saying, you know, I've gained an an intuitive understanding or a learned understanding of food from the ingredient standpoint. Because if you understand the ingredients and the basic concepts, you're far more teachable and adaptive than somebody coming in who's just learned the recipes. Um, so yeah, take the course uh, to learn the fundamentals, but then really understand that it's the application of fundamentals where the real learning happens figure out the difference between searing a piece of cod and a piece of salmon. That's where the real learning is. You'll already learned how to sear. It's learning how to use those techniques to really understand ingredients that matters. So I just say every day when you're cooking, really pay attention to the ingredients. Is this lemon sour? Is it dry? Is it super juicy? Is it, is it sweet? Is it aromatic? How did that affect the outcome of my vinaigrette? When you have that type of, of knowledge and, and the lens through which to look at food, then you become truly valuable in a restaurant, uh, in, a, in a professional kitchen, and that's where you're going to earn opportunity to continue to advance. So, jump. hey, best of luck and best wishes with your dream. I really hope that you pursue that because it is a delicious dream and uh, one you deserve to accomplish. So, cheers. Thanks, bye. All right, Tom, Chef Barton, I'm a big fan of less popular fresh seafood, bluefish and mackerel. Well then, Tom, you and I are friends because you just mentioned my two favorite fish. Come on over anytime, let's cook. Can you please share some tips for cooking these oily fish? I'm gonna ask you your secret for growing luscious peaches in your garden, maybe some other time. 
All right. Um, well, Tom, I have a feeling that you and I already are friends. Uh, so I hope I wish you all the very best. I hope uh, you and family are doing well. Uh, to the luscious peaches question, I don't know. It's magic. I live in Maine. I don't know how I pull it off. Uh, I think it's that uh, I live on land that cows lived on for 185 years before we bought this house. So the soil is pretty good. I mean, you, you drop a seed. You better watch out. It'll, that, that plant will jump up and hit you in the butt. This is good soil. Uh, we also got a protected coastal environment. So it's kind of this nice little microclimate. Uh, but cooking oily fish such as mackerel and bluefish, uh, the key to me, it, 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 it's all about buying fresh fish there. There's nothing I can do to make up for poor quality bluefish or mackerel or poor quality seafood of any kind, but especially the oily rich fish. Uh, and oily rich fish also desperately need some acidity to be paired with them. Uh, and so it's not so much about how you cook it because... Well, whether you sear it and saute it, whether you broil it, roast it at high heat, whether you grill it, um, you're going to get great outcomes from it. Uh, but really, the acidity is what's going to provide that balance. And, and as we all know, it's balance in cooking that really brings things to the next level. Uh, that's what really makes things sing. So uh, whether that's a marinade ahead of time, in a little bit of uh, vinegar or acidulated marinade to kind of set the protein a little bit before you grill it is a great way to do it, especially with mackerel. That's good. Um, classic New England cuisine was to soak mackerel in milk, that lactic acid performing that function uh, before they then cooked it. So uh, with oily fish, I like high heat uh, and I like acid. Hey, thanks, Tom. I hope you're well, buddy. All right, Tamara. Hey, Chef, can you substitute seafood or fish for plant-based protein and recipes during the course? Uh, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm sure you can. I, I'm less familiar with the ins and outs of the specific uh, recipes that are used in the plant-based course, but certainly seafood lends itself to a plant-forward, plant-based diet. Uh, and it should be small, enjoyable, adequate portions of seafood that blend well with all the ingredients around them. So vegetarian or, or vegetable forward cuisine tends to really focus on the, the principles of integration of flavors. Uh, and that's what works so well with seafood. So uh, the individual recipe notwithstanding, uh, yeah, I would say seafood is absolutely a good stand in or addition to a lot of vegetable forward cuisine. Hey, thanks. All right, KR. A fresh, usable piece of frozen halibut uh, fished up in Alaska. There's great sustainable fisheries up there. I'm just thinking of defrosting and making ceviche. Do you have a favorite recipe for halibut ceviche? And would it work well from this frozen halibut? Um, to be honest, I, I don't find halibut to be a great ceviche fish. Uh, I find it can be a little chalky uh, in, in its final form. Uh, and while it's certainly good, I just don't think it's it's the best use of halibut. I don't think it's the best way to flatter uh, that fish. Uh, but it certainly it certainly can be delicious. Uh, I would go a little bit lighter on the acid, uh, higher on the aromatic flavors. So if you're making a leche de tigre. Um, you know, big on ginger, big on, uh, you know, some mint pureed in there with your aji amarillo chilies. Uh, so go heavier on the aromatic ingredients, lighter on the acid, and uh, marinate it for a longer time to allow that softer acid to do the same, to get you to the same place, but at a lower, slower time. Halibut is pretty delicate in that way. Hey, thanks. I hope it works out. I'm sure it'll be delicious. Cheers, Cap. Sharon, thanks for these amazing lectures. Hey, I'm really appreciating them. Oh, that's just sharing some very kind words, Sharon. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, Trish, you volunteer at an emergency shelter and want to be able to use similar ingredients that we get from the food bank to produce meals for 65 people. How can this course help me? Well, huh. So batch cooking with seafood can be a little difficult because of the, well, the need for it to be cooked a little more delicately. Uh, and the fact that stews, well, salmon stews really well, but it doesn't stew as well as a hind of beef, for example. 
Uh, it's just not as resilient to cooking in that same way. Um, so I would say look to, uh, you know, I mean, food pantries and a lot of stuff you're getting, out of, you're getting high quality frozen. Uh, and I know there's a lot of canned seafood that goes through there. And canned seafood is an absolutely delicious ingredient, especially you know, canned pink salmon or red salmon from Alaska with the skin and the bones cooked right into it for all that added nutrition that adds nothing in terms of texture or flavor, um, you know, nothing off-putting at all. So salmon cakes, great way to do it. You can produce those in large volumes. Uh, salmon melts, really great way. The key to a salmon melt that will last in batch cooking is to toast the bread first. So you're drying it out a little bit, giving it some structural contrast to the, the moist salmon mixture that goes on top. Um, so yes, the principles taught in the course to, to teach you about the elemental nature of seafood will certainly set you up for success for knowing which methods to pursue and, and how to think about preparing seafood for many people. Uh, but I also want to say a hey, thank you for your work, for your volunteerism. Uh, it's incredibly important and, uh, well needed everywhere and especially in this time. So, uh, Trish. Thank you. We, we, we all appreciate you. Much love. Okay, Brett. Uh, work in retail and have seen increased sales in seafood due to limiting of meat options because of COVID. Yeah, a very interesting turn of events. Do you think increased focus on seafood will create problems in availability sustainably now in the future? Uh, <laughs> nuanced and great question, Brett. Um, so one of the other things that's happening because of COVID is that a lot of seafood fresh counters are being curtailed in their offerings uh, to limit, well, the number of deliveries and the frequency of deliveries coming to the back door of retail. Uh, also to limit the amount of interaction between the counter staff and the, the customer, which all makes perfect sense. And so a lot of stores I've seen have been limiting their options to salmon, tilapia, shrimp, tuna, the, the things they know sell at bulk. And a lot of places are going almost exclusively to frozen. I think that is a ultimately a good thing uh, because frozen seafood, in my opinion, is should be a major, a bigger part of the future of our seafood industry because it, well, it has some environmental impacts due to less waste because it's not as perishable, slower transport, so you don't have as much greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you can you can fish uh, in during the season of that fish when it's abundant, but then sell it throughout the year. So it actually benefits the fishermen and the communities quite a lot more because they're not up against this this market demand that's all, all at once. But they can really really stand. So I think frozen seafood is a great thing, and I hope that coming out of this, that that becomes more a staple of of retail service. Um, but uh, do I think that there, this will create sustainability and availability problems uh, in the near term on the availability? Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of countries have put in export, uh, you know, have, have banned exporting of products so as to maintain food security. And I'm thinking about countries like India, which is a major uh, farm shrimp producer. So we're beginning to see shortages of some commodity products that are globally traded, like shrimp. Um, we're also beginning to see some issues around COVID closures in packing plants. Uh, the, there was a closure just in the past couple of days of a tuna packing plant, a canned tuna packing plant in Ghana. Um, so we're going to see some hiccups in availability. Uh, also, fishing is a, is a high-intensity activity and, and it's very hard to be six feet away from somebody on a boat at all times uh, when the boat is only so big. Um, so there, there are some immediate concerns, but in terms of availability, the marketplace will, will figure it out uh, and the market will fill any voids with, with other products. And I think it's up to us as consumers to be willing to buy what, what's available and not just say, yeah, but I want my shrimp. There's no shrimp available. Great. Okay, I'll take the snapper. That's what we got to do. But in terms of sustainability, I, I think ultimately a greater shift towards frozen is a great thing, as I explained, but also a greater shift away from meat uh, or reduction in meat consumption, land animal proteins, and a rise in 
uh, seafood is a very good thing ultimately. Uh, seafood is categorically more environmentally efficient. You and I and pigs and chickens and cows fight gravity and atmospheric pressure and we grow big bones and lots of connective tissue uh, to fight those pressures. We spend a lot of energy to keep our blood warm. Fish? No, I did. Oh, that's cool. I'll just sit here and float. They live in a buoyant, neutral environment that's a lot gentler. Uh, they have less connective tissue. I mean, a cow has 14% of their body is connective tissue, whereas in a fish, it's 3%, for example. Um, so you're just, the fish spends more time growing more meat per calorie of energy. And, um, and in a world of declining or static resources uh, and increasing population, looking at just basic biological efficiencies is a great thing. Uh, plus, if we're wondering how we're going to feed 9 billion people on this planet with a growing population, well, I think the answer, sh a big part of the answer should be to look at 70% of the planet that is ocean, lakes or rivers, um, and understand that's, that has to be part of our future more, more so. Brett, thank you so much for your question. That's a great one. All right, Antonio, what gives you the inspiration to create new and unique dishes? Uh, Tuesday. Wednesday. Uh, the fact that we eat every day, and though every bite of food I, I feel blessed and fortunate to eat, uh, of course there's fatigue. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in the same recipes over and over again. Um, and that's where seasonality comes into play. Antonio, it's, it's really about, I think, mirroring what you feel like physically with what's available. And if you should uh, be so fortunate to have the luxury of shopping at a farmer's market or shopping seasonally in that way, uh, the recipes and the inspiration write, writes itself. Um, and because the world tells you what ingredients to use because those are the ingredients that are available. Um, and, and having to throw together to figure something out with what's available is, is a really great way to, to really up the ante on your own cooking skills. Um, but also to continuously inspire and to learn anew. And you know what, Antonio? Not every dish that I create is good. And that's as important of a learning experience as is creating something really awesome that I'm going to replicate again. Knowing what not to do in food is a really helpful thing. Hey, thanks, Antonio. All right, we got just a few more. We got Pradeep here. Um, uh, hey, chef. Uh, if the chef who's making seafood, if she allergic uh, an allergic reaction to the seafood, but loves to cook it, how will he or she taste the final product? Huh. I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Um, and if, if you can't ingest it, you can't taste it. Um, I would just say uh, really understanding the the fundamentals of cooking and tasting every other aspect of a dish, uh, you know, really in that final tasting, what you're looking for uh, is not so much the pairing, but did I balance it? Is it right? Is the salt to the sweetness, to the acidity, to the fat, is that balance there? Uh, oftentimes you don't really need to taste the protein itself to know that that balance is going to be there. Um, learning how to season a piece of fish properly is a skill set you, you just have to taste for. I don't, so I don't have a way around that for you. But tasting all of the components of a dish, tasting all the components together of a dish uh, does give you a, a really good idea of the, of the total outcome. So, hey, that's a little challenging question. Thank you, pretty. I wish you well. All right, Nikiko. Well. There's only one Nikiko I know and I've ever heard of, and he's a good friend and uh, one hell of a chef, too. Uh, so Chef Nikiko down in New York City, he joined me recently. I cooked at the James Beard House, cooking a dinner there with some friends, and uh, he was so kind to volunteer and come in and cook. And, uh, yeah, he blew me away. And, uh, well, we've been friends ever since. And, I, hey, I really appreciate you, Chef. You're, you're a great man, and all the best to your family. So you're a great mentor. Thank you for the kind words. Question for you. If I'm going to start a seafood restaurant, what are the easier and simpler seafoods to start off with? Hmm. Uh, you know what, Nikita? I'm going to go back to what are your dishes? You know, what's the concept of your restaurant? Are you going, uh, you know, island style? 
Uh, are you going Chesapeake style? Are you going fish and chips style? Are you going Pacific Northwest? Uh, any of those sort of declarations will certainly help you narrow down the fish that are most appropriate to that cuisine. That doesn't mean you can't substitute with whatever the catch of the day is. Uh, so I would say really write your menu first <laughs> and then look at you know, what fish <clears throat> traditionally fit into that type of recipe. So if it's a fish and chips, for example, um, it's a flaky white flesh fish that fits really well into that. Okay, well, what are the quality characteristics of flaky white flesh fish that make it work? Uh, well, large flake, um, you know, dense texture to it, uh, you know, low aroma, high moisture content, all of these things. So, okay, what are the other fish that eat like that? Oh, okay, well, monkfish is not it. Monkfish is dense, it's meaty, it's taut, it's, it's elastic and snappy in its bite and texture. It ain't gonna work, man, it ain't gonna work. Not in a big fish and chips you know, preparation. If you slice it thin into little sheets, yeah, it'd, it'd be great. So think about what you want the final dish to be and then go back to that culinary category kind of classification, um, you know, and uh, yeah. The, but the easiest fish to work with is gonna be the one that you have great access to uh, so that you can maintain consistency because good restaurants are consistent before anything else. I mean, that's it. You got to execute day in and day out. Um, so find fish that you have good access to um, and then, uh, you know, and, and access good quality to. So, hey, Nikiko, I wish you all the best, man. Best to you and family and, uh, and to all of you that have joined us. Uh, so many of you today. I really appreciate all your great questions. I appreciate so many of you shared some very kind words. Um, and hey, on this lovely beautiful spring day up here on the delicious coast of Maine. I'll just remind you uh, and say again, thank you. Feeding people is an act of love. It is an act of kindness, and we need that today. So you are on the front line of providing kindness for others, taking care of others, sustaining each other. So much love to you. Much love to your families. I wish you delicious cooking. And please come back again. See us Thursdays here at 2 o'clock Eastern, well, 11 o'clock uh, Pacific time. I believe we might be taking a week off next week, but we're going to start up with a new sort of curated theme of courses starting again a uh, week after next. So we'll be in touch. Until then, take care. Be delicious. Bye.